All right. Um, good afternoon, Talafalava, uh, Kiorana, Bulavinaka, uh, Malo Elile. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's uh, training session on behalf of the Pacific Learning Partnership for Environmental and Social Sustainability. Uh, I want to thank you all for making the time available to join us from across the Pacific region. It's uh, always nice to have you here. I'm joined here by the Acting Director uh, for the Environmental Monitoring and Governance Program of SPRIP, Mr. Uh, Ratu Chope Tavitanivalu, um, and my other colleagues here from IT. So thank you very much uh, for joining us. We're about to start. Uh, can everybody please uh, turn on your cameras just so we can see the lovely faces that we're talking to before you decide to take off your, turn off your, your camera. It's always nice to put a, a face to a name. Thank you for always coming back to, uh, <laughs> to, the, to, to, our, uh, uh, to our training webinars. Um, Okay. All right. Um, all right. So let me just uh, kick off and start off with the today's module. Today's module, as you would have seen in the training plan, it's uh, module 13. Uh, we're continuing for, uh, in the second round of training. Uh, the title of today's module is Land Impact and Use in the Pacific, an alliance between Pacific Land Tenure and the ADP World Bank's Environment and Social Framework. And so there's a bit of a narrative that sort of describes uh, the, 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 the emergence or the development of this module. I'll read it out loud. So infrastructure development in the Pacific often uh, impacts on land through its use and access. Now, through the application of the World Bank's fifth environment and social standard uh, across the region, the World Bank has demonstrated demonstrable experiences of applying various approaches to managing access and use of land for project related activities. Now, the training here was specifically discussed the participatory approach to the design and management of land use and land access in general. And you will probably hear sort of examples around uh, topics like uh, benefit sharing agreements, voluntary donations, changes in access, community land donations, grievance redress mechanisms, sources of funding, et cetera. I do want to note that this, um, this module is essentially a continuation of the module we did in the first round, which is a module seven, uh, which we also um, introduced participants, many of you to the ESS, um, ESS five of the World Bank, which is the involved, um, land acquisitions, restrictions on land use and involuntary resettlement with a focus on land ownership. That was done last year. And many of you uh, were very happy with that, uh, with that, uh, with that training. And, and through the evaluations, you had asked for sort of a, con a continuation of this. So I'm happy to, um, at this moment, introduce uh, our key trainers, our key presenters who did the first round and now the second round. Uh, I have here joining us live from Sydney, Canberra, um, from the World Bank, um, Joyce, Miss Joyce Onguglu, and Dr. Rebecca Ramsey, who are both uh, social development specialists with the World Bank. Fantastic ladies, have a wealth of experience, and I'm happy to always learn from them. So um, thank you very much, uh, Joyce and Dr. Ramsey, for, for joining us today. I think I'll hand over to you now, uh, the controls, and uh, please, uh, over to you. Oh, and please use the chat box um, to ask questions either at the end of the presentations or uh, during, during the presentations, please use the hand prompt so we can uh, come to you. I'd prefer if you come online, turn on your video and ask a, a question, but if not, the we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, chat box will, is, is sufficient. All right. Thank you, ladies. Over to you. Great. Thank you, Matt Pello. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Um... Just checking the sound. Is that okay? Great. Yeah, we're good. Fantastic. So Rebecca and I will be uh, presenting on the topic of lands today. Um, and I think Rebecca is just sharing our slide at the moment. But thank you so much uh, for joining. It's really exciting to see a second round of training for our PLP. So I'm Joyce Onguglo, um, Social Development Specialist with the World Bank in Sydney as Mayor Pello um, introduced us earlier, and we'll get started. Um, Rebecca, let us know how you go. 
Thanks very much, Joyce. Can I just check that you can all see the presentation? Uh, yes, you might want to yep. put it in full screen. That's good. The presentation is on. Thanks very much. Okay, so I'll just maximize. I just click the little uh, screen on the top left corner. That should How's that looking? Out. All right, so hello everybody. Uh, welcome along to our session today. As uh, Joyce had just said, we're going to talk about land impact and use in the Pacific. And we'll be talking uh, to some of the uh, content related to the World Bank's Environmental and Social uh, Standard 5, which is about land acquisition, restrictions on land use and involuntary resettlement. But we also know that some of the practitioners joining the session today will also be using other types of um, good international practice standards, such as the Asian Development Bank's um, uh, Safeguards Policy Statement 2009. You might be using DFAT's uh, Safeguards Policies or some other kind of international safeguard policy. So we want to make this session relevant as possible and we invite you to raise any sorts of questions or comments that you have about how the standards that you're working with might apply in the particular context that you're working in. So just to start us off, we thought it would be wonderful to hear where where are you signing in from um, in the session today? If, if you can have a go at the chat bar there, um, Joyce and I are having a look. We'd love to hear where you're signing in from, which country, which town are you are you sitting right now? And any reflections on particular things you might be interested in today? Um, in terms of why are you here? Um, what is it that you'd like to, to hear about? We'll, as much as possible, try to make the session um, relevant to you. So as you're um, putting into the chat bar some comments there, just to do a quick overview of how we're going to uh, use the session or what we've, what we've proposed. And we thought we'd do two uh, two sort of parts to our session today. The first one, we thought we'd take the first hour to look a little bit at some of the definitions um, when we're looking at this, uh, this standard on land use. Let's make sure that we're all on the same page about what we are talking about when we're talking about involuntary resettlement or displacement um, and who is a displaced person. We'll then take a question and answer and we'll pause uh, 50 minutes from now for a, a break um, so that everyone can just take a little breather. And then we'll rejoin for part two. And this is where we're going to try to get into some of the details about looking at the state land governance systems and how they might be different from customary governance systems. Because quite often in the Pacific, you can be dealing with two systems working at the same time, either in parallel or perhaps working together. And that's where some of the complexity around working with land acquisition or land use or restrictions to land can come in uh, when, we're, when we're working with this kind of standard. So we're hoping very much to not talk for the whole session and, and really open up to hear about what sorts of things you're doing in your practice, what sorts of questions you have. So as we're going along, um, please do use the chat bar. It's really great to see many of you um, inputting already. Let us know what sorts of um, you know, situations you might be confronting in your practice. Okay, so just to start us off now, of course, the majority of, of the people here today are um, Pacific Islanders yourselves and also people who have been working in the Pacific for a long time. So you certainly will understand that when we're talking about land use, uh, land acquisition, it's a, it's a truly complex issue um, across all of the countries in the Pacific. Um, you'll know that the majority of land in the, in the Pacific is customarily owned. Um, and that's often, you know, part of the constitution. Um, it's well recognized within 
the legal frameworks of country systems. And when I say country systems, I mean the laws and regulations that govern um, each country. Land itself um, is often a source of conflict. And that can be not just because land itself is a valuable asset, but uh, as you'll know, land is so much more than some kind of um, commodity. It's actually so central to the cultural and spiritual and worldviews of Pacific Islanders. It is part of people's identity. Um, it is who they are. It is where they are from. Um, it's so much more than just something to be sold and exchanged. It, it's truly integral to um, Pacific Islander identity. And in this sense, um, it can also uh, form a very strong point of conflict at times when we have different types of disputes over um, rights and, and resources. Land is becoming, a, is becoming scarce, um, both in times of development in the sense that we now have different types of actors coming into the Pacific uh, wanting to, with interest in land. Um, in this sense, it could be private developers, uh, it could be foreign entities, foreign governments wanting to establish a presence in the Pacific. Um, and in addition to this, of course, we have the impacts of climate change and natural disasters, which are also profoundly impacting um, land use and availability in the Pacific. In addition to that, we have migrants, uh, people who might be moving from one island to another within a country or even from one country to another in the Pacific um, it, as a response to climate-induced migration. Um, sorry, I can just see Joyce's point there. Is that better, Joyce? Okay, so um, most of you will also be aware, of course, that land is owned both through the, pat through the patrilineal and the matrilineal lines. So in some places, um, in fact, it is the women who, who hold the land rights. Um, and in some places, it is the men that the, the land is being passed down uh, through generations, through either the female or the male line. This has a huge implication um, for how land acquisition, land use and land restrictions are actually negotiated because, of course, when we're talking about any kind of land use and projects, we need to be sure that we're talking to the correct authorities and also making sure that we're inclusive in the way that we do that. So quite broadly, I'm going to just review now what the objective of um, good international practices in land acquisition restrictions on land use and voluntary resettlement is. And it could not be stated uh, enough that the number one principle when we're trying to look at land use is that we want to absolutely avoid as much as possible um, any type of involuntary uh, acquisition of land, involuntary um, use of land. In, in all cases, we, the preference is always to work through negotiated um, approaches where people are having the option to decline having their land, their private lands uh, used for a project. And when, and, and part of the way that we do this is by looking for alternatives. So for example, it's quite frequent in a World Bank funded project that if we're going to do, for example, solar panels, we might try to, instead of putting the solar panels in the property of uh, private landowners or customary landowners, we'd be looking for some government lease to land instead. So we might see that there's a health clinic where we can put some solar panels on top of the clinic itself. We're always looking as much as possible to minimize the extent to which we need to use private, um, private owner's land. In the event that, in fact, we're unable to uh, find suitable land in order to do a project, we're then looking at mitigating adverse impacts. And that's through making sure that 
adequate compensation and assistance is provided um, to the affected parties so that uh, they won't in fact experience a negative impact as a result of the land taking or the land use. So um, to provide an example of that, when we go to a plot of land, let's imagine again, we're going to do a solar panel, um, make a solar panel site. If it is the case that we were going to um, invite people to provide some land for the solar panels placement, we would be looking to compensate uh, for the, not the market value, but the replacement value of that land. We would be offering a form of compensation and we would also be providing assistances. And the type of assistance that we're talking about here is things like if somebody would need to move a household to another location, how will they actually go about getting from that place to the other place? If their livelihood would be interrupted for a period of time, does the project have a responsibility to cover that transition period while they are out of income and so that they are able to re-establish their income um, in another place? Part of this, uh, the good international practice is really to make sure that when we think about relocating uh, people, when we think about involuntary resettlement and displacement, it's about not just uh, compensating people, but really using it as an opportunity um, to kind of improve people's living situations and livelihoods. And in this sense, um, you know, thinking of it more as a sort of development project in its own right is something that we advocate a lot in the uh, policies. Now, um, you'll see the last point there around when we do have resettlement activities. So this could be resettlement of um, people, families, communities, and then also potentially livelihoods where land is being taken and it's interrupting things like people's food gardens and it's interrupting people's small businesses. Um, this kind of a resettlement activity is a very involved process which requires a significant amount of ongoing consultation, particularly at the front, um, at the front of the planning period where we start to understand that uh, this process would, would be required. How we go about doing that um, really involves quite a bit of experience and expertise um, in terms of making sure that everyone has an opportunity to understand um, the extent of what moving to another place really means, how it would impact them, both from this sort of economic perspective um, in terms of livelihoods and also the physical aspect, like how are they going to rebuild another house, et cetera, but also thinking through things like people's um, daily lives. How do they go? Where will they go to school? Are they able to continue seeing their friends? Um, what sorts of resources, informal resources and social networks are they relying on in their daily lives? Will this resettlement, in fact, uh, remove them or disconnect them from their routines? Um, this kind of a disruption can really have a, a deep impact on people uh, and people's um, identity even. It can change the way um, that people understand their purpose in life. And these sorts of things need to be really discussed in depth um, well and truly before the actual physical relocation is starting. So we talk about meaningful consultation and we talk about informed participation. And so I just give a little bit more explanation there to kind of um, describe, you know, what we're talking about there. It's more than documenting conversations. It's fundamentally about changing people's lives and what that's going to mean for them. And that can be in a very extensive process. So this is uh, the text that has been taken straight from the World Bank's environmental and social framework. It is effectively um, the same content uh, that was in the prior slide, 
but this is exactly the text that's come from the World Bank's Environmental and Social Framework. And I understand that many of you are looking to apply this framework. So we just put this here um, so that you, you had that reference. But more broadly, um, all of the good practice standards, in fact, um, include this kind of mitigation hierarchy, if you like. And so, as I mentioned, we're talking about avoiding we're then talking about mitigating through compensation and through assistances. We're talking about improving people's lives um, if they must be physically displaced. So what does that look like? And that's where we're looking at this, this bigger piece on how do school children get connected to schools again? How does um, mothers who were receiving assistance with daycare are able to continue to access those services or access to the healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, the piece at the end there about making sure that consultation and information is provided throughout the entire process. So I just wanted to take a moment here to really get a little bit into the nuts and bolts of what do we mean by involuntary resettlement versus voluntary resettlement? It's really important to understand the difference between what is involuntary and what is voluntary. Because sometimes we can do negotiated settlement. That's a really, that's our preferred way of going about doing any type of land use or land acquisition. Um, it would be ideal if we can use negotiated settlement, meaning that we've got a willing buyer, a willing seller, meaning that the person whose land is being affected is actually quite fine with that um, going ahead, given compensation, et cetera. But even if it's negotiated, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's voluntary. So let's just take a minute to consider what is involuntary. Well, it's when persons are displaced and are not given the right and option to refuse either land acquisition and or displacement from land. So what this means is that if I am living in a hut that is on top of a gold mine and the company comes and asks me, we would like to negotiate with you um, on, this, on this plot of land because we'd like to access this gold. Now, I might be thinking, okay, I'm very happy for this. Actually, I was planning to move anyway, and the compensation looks good. Nonetheless, that's an, an, an example of involuntary resettlement. And the reason is that unless that land is being taken, unless that land is being used for the project, the project site can't be somewhere else. A mine is fixed. It's in one location. And if I happen to be living on top of that mine, and that land, and I decide to sell that land, it's nonetheless being sold on an involuntary basis in the sense that I cannot refuse it uh, for the project to go ahead. So that's kind of the litmus test, if you like, on whether it's voluntary or involuntary. It's like this, could this project go ahead if this person doesn't give this land? If the answer is no, then you're talking about an involuntary situation. So if we're thinking about voluntary resettlement or voluntary land acquisition or voluntary displacement, this is a situation where people are genuinely able to say, no, I don't want this piece of land to be taken. And then the project can say, no problem. We're gonna simply use design features to change the way that the project is a tiny bit and we can nonetheless continue with the project. That's an example where it is voluntary. So see um, here in the picture, we've got a road and what happens with roads is sometimes we talk about people donating or um, contributing small strips of land on the side of a road. Some of you might've had experience with this. Um, there'll be a little bit of land on the side of the road and the design, the design team is saying, if we could just take a little bit of land at the top of your property and, ex and just widen the road a little bit, um, that's going to make for a better, safer road here. So we'd like to take this strip of land. Can we purchase this land off you? Or if you are not happy for us to take that piece of land, what we'll do instead 
is we'll use some safety features. So we'll use the road that we've already got, we'll improve it, and then we'll put in speed bumps and we'll put in some safety features like some flashing lights um, to let drivers know to slow down at this part. So that means that me as the landowner, I can say, yeah, I've decided, no, I don't want to give that little strip of land. I want to keep my land. So the design team says, no problem. And we can just put in the safety features with a similar outcome. So this is a true example of where the, do where the land being given um, is being done on a voluntary basis. I'm not being forced in any sense because I can say no, project continues. If anyone has any questions about what I've just said there, please um, just pop them in the sidebar. And as I mentioned, we're gonna really open this up for a bit of a discussion at the end. So we've just had a talk about involuntary versus voluntary. And I've said that for any type of land use, acquisition or restriction to be done on a voluntary basis it means that the person who owns the land needs to be able to say no I'm not going to give it for the project and the project can still go ahead all other types are classified as involuntary let's now just have a little talk about types of displacement So when we go about taking people's um, or, or looking for a project's looking to use someone's land, either they're looking to lease the land, they're looking to acquire the land, they're looking to temporarily lease the land. Um, all of these things can be either temporary or permanent. There are two different types of displacement that can occur. So the first type, is where is called economic displacement. And that is where you've got some form of activity that is happening on the land that the project would like to use um, that, is, that is contributing towards someone's livelihoods. So for example, in this picture here, it looks like we've got um, someone who is using the land for farming it looks like they've got some rice or some wheat um, drying out on the land. If this piece of land was being proposed to be used for a project, um, then what we can see here is that this worker is going to be economically displaced. It means that she is not going to be able to continue her economic activity in this site. And what that means is that she needs to receive some form of compensation and or replacement in terms of how she is now going to continue her livelihood, whether that means helping her to identify other places to uh, continue the similar activity. It might involve helping her with training in terms of reskilling and finding other types of work that she could be doing. And it could mean transition allowance in terms of helping her in that transition period. And it could mean other things. So on every project, we will review the situation of the individuals who are affected in order to come down on um, what is a fair compensation and assistance that would ultimately lead to them either at the very least replacing and ideally improving their economic situation. And physical displacement is the other main type of displacement that you'll see. And this is where we're talking about um, loss of physical assets, the shelter, and that's where people are living. So we're talking about people, households or communities physically moving off the land. And both of these types, honestly, they're both extremely complex types of displacement. Both have their own unique challenges to work through. And it would be really great at the end of um, this short presentation to hear from you about some of your experiences, either dealing with economic displacement or physical displacement. I think some of you will be familiar with the idea of people's um, sort of food gardens being displaced, which is part of economic displacement, where sometimes you'll find that, for example, people will start planting um, food gardens onto the government leased land, for example. 
And so sometimes we have a situation quite frequently where um, we're talking about people not being able to continue their farming um, on government lands. That takes us quite uh, neatly to the next type of definitional category that we'd like to cover off here, which is about the types of displaced people. So we've mentioned that there's economic displacement that occurs and there's physical displacement that occurs, but the types of people that are being physically or economically displaced uh, also have different types of categories that we need to be aware of when we're looking at applying uh, this land standard. So the typical type of affected person that we think of is the person who has formal legal rights to land or assets. We call these people title holders. And of course, in the Pacific, these people might be customary landowners because the word title holders usually refers to the government, the state's legal uh, land system. It usually refers to what the Ministry of Lands has done in terms of mapping out a cadaster and actually saying, look, here's a legally registered person with a land title, a title holder. But of course, customary landowners are also title holders, whether that is formalised by the Ministry of Lands or not. The dual systems are recognised. So we've got people who have what we're going to call formal rights in the sense that they are recognised as being the rightful um, owners of the land or the, who hold the title. But then we also have non-title holders. And this is a particularly important uh, category for us as pe people practitioners who are looking at this standard to understand. So these are people who have claim to land or assets that is potentially um, not recognised under national law. So that's where, for example, in a situation where the whole community understand that there is a person with um, claims to land, for example, but they were never recognised uh, in any formal capacity, um, but everyone understands that they are actually the rightful owner. So this is someone who has sort of claims to a piece of land or resources. And it can also be someone who is actually occupying a piece of land um, who is without any sort of legal um, sort of entitlement to be there. So it's a little bit confusing what I've just said. So let me just use an example. Um, if the government has a piece of land that is leased and over time, for, for 10 years that land has been sitting vacant and over time I decide to start living on that land. Maybe I've asked the permission of the ministry who owns that land, maybe I haven't. But at the point when the project is ready to go, if I am living on that land with a hut, um, I have occupied that land and I, am, I now am a non-title uh, non holder who is occupying the land. So this means someone who is on the land, living on the land at the time in which the project is um, being considered and or someone who is using the land so that for their food gardens, for example, or for having a small business. So, for example, sometimes you'll see in some countries that like mamas could put up a market on the side of the road. Now, that land that they're using there, they don't have any formal title to that land but they are nonetheless non-title holders who are using that land for their livelihoods. And under this standard, non-title holders and title holders have um, rights and entitlements to compensation and to assistance. Um, okay, so I've just seen item C will be an example of those that are considered squatters. I missed item C. Okay, sorry. Who have no recognisable legal claim? Yes. Okay, that's exactly right. So um, number C there, talking about people occupying, they are called squatters quite often. And people who are using um, the land for economic means, we refer to them as encroachers. So I believe that might actually be our next 
slide. Okay, yep, sorry. So here's the, this, the second photo there is an example of someone who is encroaching. This land does not belong to these two people. It belongs to someone else. It's recognized, uh, the title is recognized with someone else, but nonetheless, they are here. They have been planting this crop. These people are non-title holders um, and they are encroaching on a piece of land, whether there's a formal agreement or not. They're not non-title holders and they are recognized under the international standard. Okay, so this is the last slide and then we're going to move to a bit of a sort of question raising and wanting to hear from you all about your experiences with this. So just in terms of mechanisms for accessing land for a project. So there are other parts of the world where forced and involuntary land acquisition is happening. Like it's very common in India, for example, um, that the government uses its powers of eminent domain to come in and under the, the kind of uh, rationale of in the public interest, they can just announce, um, we're sorry, your land is in a, an area of public interest and we are going to acquire it by force and you will receive this compensation. That situation just simply does not tend to happen in the Pacific. Um, in part, it's because of the very um, strong entitlement that customary landowners have. Um, it's also um, just seen as basically the, the fairly poor practice if we can avoid it. Because as mentioned with the mitigation hierarchy, we want to avoid as much as possible impacts to land, land use, land acquisition. So by, by using forced acquisition, um, this generally, it, it's not considered um, the best approach. The best approach is negotiate, negotiated settlements. So this is where we've got kind of similar to, you know, if you're purchasing a house, you would go and you would, you would have a willing seller, someone who's ready to sell and wanting to sell their land, and you've got a willing buyer. So the buyer in this situation is the government wanting to do the project and so they come to an agreement on the price of the negotiation. And as I mentioned, sometimes even negotiated settlement is still technically involuntary if the project couldn't go ahead without that land. So it's not that negotiated settlement is voluntary. It's not necessarily voluntary, um, but it should be done on the terms that are reasonable to the seller. And this means that, you know, it just makes the entire acquisition process a lot better for all parties. It should be more of a win-win kind of a scenario. And the other more common mechanism that we see for accessing land um, is through voluntary land donation or lease. Now, in both cases, we're talking about acquisition or we're talking about leasing. Um, and I think Joyce will be talking more about that in the next session. But many of you will be familiar with voluntary land donation or leasing as a suggestion. It, it quite often comes up. Um, the government ministries are quite used to using voluntary land donations. Um, and there's sort of a perception that it's like an easier approach to go to, because as we all know, in the Pacific, with the Ministry of Lands formalization land processes, it really can take quite a long time. Um, to sort of get through even a lease can take quite a long time, um, land acquisition even longer. And, um, you know, that situation can be also further complicated by the fact that we could have multiple people making claims to a piece of land and we need to untangle, you know, who exactly are the rightful owners of the land. There's a lot to unpack. And sometimes there's a lot of pressure on us as practitioners to try to shortcut that process. Um, however, voluntary land donations and leases actually still require a significant amount of due diligence, clarification on the rightful owners, um, and, and they still involve a significant amount of consultation as well. It's not actually the case necessarily that they're the fastest way to go about um, getting those land agreements in. Okay, so 
Let's have a quick talk about um, informed consent and power of choice, which is um, around voluntary land donation. So power of choice is actually talking about what I'd mentioned about whether I can decline the pro decline to provide my land. So um, this is about it being truly voluntary. So if someone is saying, I would like to give my land to this project, it has to be the case that the project would continue, as I said, even if, um, even if I don't give that donation. So power of choice means you that the donor itself has the right to decline with no adverse impacts at all. Informed consent means that the individual who is being asked to donate a piece of land is actually um, fully aware that they are entitled to compensation. They are actually entitled to receive compensation and assistances under the project. And they have decided that they are happy, they want to forego um, those, those entitlements and compensations, and they would rather donate that piece of land for nothing. Now, you might be thinking, under what situation would anyone ever want to do that? And basically, another condition of voluntary donation is that the donation itself should be so marginal that it would basically really not impact uh, the household or the individual um, in terms of their livelihoods or the plot of their land in any significant way at all. And that's another measurement that would need to be addressed as part of doing voluntary donation. Usually um, what you do see in international good practice um, due diligence about voluntary donations is that we take this rule of donation cannot be more than 5% or more than 10% of the overall land holding. So where you, if we're looking at a donation, we're talking about a tiniest little strip of the corner of someone's land potentially. Um, but as I mentioned, just about negotiated settlement, we always prefer to go negotiated settlement over voluntary donation. So this is a very unique case um, that we're talking about. Another um, requisite, a, a prerequisite of doing voluntary donation is that if someone is going to be donating um, a, a tiny piece of their land for a project, well, they should be receiving some direct benefits. And, and the idea basically is that the donation is going to offset, um, in fact, the compensation that they might have received anyway. So to give you an example, um, sometimes we have a case where for, for the government would like to build a seawall on the corner of somebody's property where without that seawall, the land itself would actually become unusable because the sea would be, the waves would be coming over onto the land, the land would become salty, you couldn't do your crops anymore, and it may not even be possible to live there anymore. So by taking a small strip of the front of someone's land and them donating it, it means that um, they will receive a kind of compensation in the sense of they will save, uh, they will save their own land by having provided in kind a little strip. So that's an example of how someone directly benefits through the compensation. Um, just to, yeah, okay, so thanks, Joyce. Okay, now donation donations also cannot result from coercion. And the, way, the main way that um, you see international good practice applying that concept is would generally be asking that a third party is there witnessing the entire engagement and making sure that, okay, this is being done. Um, this is being done without pressure. This person um, is agreeing to um, donate this land and, and it wasn't done with coercion. No one, no one held a knife to their throat and told them they had to do it. But we have to be so careful with this uh, with this point about looking at coercion, because if we say, if we suggest that if a person doesn't donate a piece of land, then there's a chance, for example, we imply in any way that there's a chance the project might not go ahead. You can imagine what will happen next is that the whole community 
will get behind bullying the person who's being asked to donate and push them to donate. So we have to be very, very careful about how we look at coercion and making sure that any decision to give a donation is is truly done um, of free will. And, And I think the real litmus test of that is to determine, is this individual actually going to really benefit from this donation? Um, and is it such a tiny donation that it truly has no impact on their lives, their household, household their assets? Okay. All right, so that's, that's um, all of the definitions of this land standard out of the way. What we'd like to do now is open up a little bit to hearing from you um, with your reflections about what you've experienced. Now, I noticed Claire has written some really um, some good points there about her experience with voluntary land donation. Um, Claire, it would be great if you wouldn't mind kicking us off with your reflections. And um, if, ever, if you could just perhaps put your hand up and, um, Joyce, do you want to moderate uh, the question and answer? And we'll just go to 50 minutes past and then we'll take our um, break. So we'll just open up now to hear from from you all. Here are the questions. Um, Have you come across these definitions in your project work? Uh, Was there anything that wasn't too clear or you'd like to follow up on? And then please just share any examples you might have about how this policy has applied We know it's really complex. So if you've got any specifically interesting examples or questions, um, please bring them forth. All right, I better mute my mic because there's some crazy birds in the background here. Okay, over to... um, Rebecca, I'm just going to read what Claire put in the chat box in case people don't have access to it. Um, So Claire's just put in the question, significant amount of consultation to reach informed consent is required. Often project timelines do not factor this. Um, How can this be resolved? Um, And in my experience, voluntary land donation only makes sense when the land size is immaterial and two, the landowners directly benefit from the project, such as accessing clean water. So it'll be really good. I think for the first question in terms of um, consultation to reach informed consent is required. Uh, We'll talk about that later as well, but um, One important aspect of doing your um, assessment is really um, consultation. And it's um, consultation throughout the life cycle of the project. So getting um, on board first at the very beginning, making sure that um, you um, contact the, you know, um, a part of the project preparation and design at the very early stages, that there are uh, consultations that take place, I think, in terms of informed consent, it's also um, what I've suggested to a lot of our officers on the ground is um, don't feel bad about um, going back. So if you do a consultation, you've gone there um, and still you there's some answers that you are not um, you don't have. Uh, don't feel bad about going back and keep doing those consultations because it's really important that you engage with the community, you engage with the stakeholders and you engage with the parties that will be affected. Um, Often we find that all consultations have been done, but it's only one consultation. You tick the box, you come back and you provide assumptions based on the consultations that I've made. So it's really good to be able to um, do as many consultations as you can, Um, especially as um, Claire mentioned, the project timelines can be quite um, tight. And under the new ESF policy, we it's even tighter. I think a lot of you who have already been working and implementing the new ESF policy, there's a real um, process that of um, different review that we um, go through. And so sometimes the consultation can be uh, quite tight in a very small time frame. But as much as as long as you keep doing the consultation, it doesn't necessarily have to always be in a formal um, setting. So even if you're doing those phone calls or informal se- settings um, as well, those are the types of consultation that we that should be recorded. Um, 
There's another question. Voluntary land donation should be min minute and noted, black and white for future references. references. So that's Aminiasi. Um, yes, that's correct. Voluntary land donation and anything, any consultations should be recorded if you can, even the informal ones. Um, Rebecca, did you have any suggestions to add or does anyone have questions? If you wanna put your hand up, please let us know. Uh, I thought that point, um, Amanasi, that you said about it should be minuted and noted in black and white for future reference, you know, the documentation, uh, the documentation about how much land take, the kind of impact to the households. Uh, who is the household? What is their situation? Are they vulnerable? Um, who's, who's in that household? Are there disabled people? Um, et cetera, et cetera. That's very critical. I wonder, um, Amanasi, would you like to share with us about your experience with voluntary donation? Was that an experience that you've had in a project? All right, possibly um, Amanasi might not be there. Claire, did you want to um, elaborate a bit more on your experiences? I don't mind at all. Um, I'm much. really keen to hear um, from other people and their experience. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I've been in the Pacific for more than a decade um, as a land and social specialist and um, yeah, land is always a challenge. It doesn't matter sort of what scale of project you're working on, what sector. It, it's um, always got uh, extremely, I guess, challenging circumstances when you're managing people's perception about their land, whether they have registered land or um, uh, legal tenure or whether they just perceive that they own the land. Um, but I guess there's a real tension point here um, in terms of the level of consultation that's required around land and, and these dialogue around, um, that needs to happen in a project time frame, particularly for infrastructure projects that, you know, take a long, they do take a long time to design and get up. But um, I find one of the challenges as a practitioner in this space is knowing when to start the consultation and having the support to start the consultation and, and actually having the budget to manage how much consultation is required. I'd be curious to hear about other people's experience and whether they feel like, um, you know, in terms of the time, lead in time for projects um, to do the proper consultation and particularly land identification. So in, I know in Papua New Guinea, they've got social mapping and landowner identification that's regularly done, but it's not, um, it's different in different countries. Very keen to hear about other people's experiences around that. Thank you. I think there is one thing you mentioned, Claire, about the people's perception, and that's really important. Um, um, I think, you know, especially uh, people's perception of, I've had an experience where... Um... Thank you. Hey, Joyce, hi, can you hear us? Yeah, can yeah, you hear I, me? I, 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 yeah, I've got a comment uh, okay. from Joe. Yep. Thank you, thank you, Rebecca, and uh, thank you, Joyce. Rebecca, thank you so much for, for such a, a wonderful presentation, and uh, it, it, it's really good. And... Uh, Yes, I, I want to follow on from uh, Aminiasi's uh, comment on voluntary land donation. And I would like to look at it from another angle. Uh, now we are talking about projects. And I want to share with you my experience in Fiji, where, where the traditional, the traditional uh, the tradition is used as uh, an element or, or to replace the minutes or the notes in black and white. It's that uh, customarily 
customer uh, relationship that establishes that, uh, that understanding that whatever land that will be given will be for the future generation uh, of the other party. So that's something uh, that I would like to, brought, uh, to bring up in this uh, conversation uh, on uh, that angle. Now we are talking about the project. I totally agree with this. Yes, a minute. Black and white is important. But uh, from my experience in Fiji, sometimes it's just the understanding mm -hmm. of the tribes. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need any black and white and it will be carried on for the future generation of those two tribes. So again, uh, thanks again for the excellent presentation. Uh, hi Joyce, uh, just me again. I just wanted to sort of uh, come in with a comment around the project life cycle. Um, so, you know, a lot of questions I get from the folks is, um, where do where does all of this take place in terms of uh, negotiating for land use and, uh, and and access of lands? Is it in the beginning of the of the project? And the assumption here is that you know all these things need to be taken care of in a nice bow tie before an actual project is approved and implementation takes uh, is, takes its course. Are you able to sort of provide a bit of comment around uh, how where all of this fits in the, the project life cycle? I know. Uh, Rebecca touched on the beginning. Uh, yep. Rebecca, did you want me to answer and then you can go in? So uh, where does this take place in the project life cycle? Um, we're really looking at integrating this throughout the entire um, project life cycle. So from the beginning, the preparation, design, Implementation all the way through to completion. Um, Patrick, thank you. If you can <laughs> mute your um, your microphone. So, um, going back to your uh, question, um, Mayor Pello. So, really looking at the entire project life cycle. So, um, making sure we have um, you know consultations right through, and this is a really critical part. And the like I said, the types of consultations is really looking at different types of consultations, whether it's formal or whether it's just, um, oh, let's have a chat under the, you know, um, coconut tree or have a chew a beetle nut and share, <laughs> share that. Um, I think a lot of the Pacific way of doing things is quite different to what, how we see it as, um, you know, the, the straightforward World Bank format where, as we um, mentioned, black and white. And going back to Jope's um, comment about, you know, a lot of the traditional um, ownership and, and uh, knowing the, the rights of the lands and stuff is all passed down by tradition and oral traditions. Um, some cultures in PNG, they actually sing, you know, sing about the uh, various, um, they have songs about um, um, the ancestral, um, you know, who their ancestors are, what the generations are and passing down the traditions in songs. And so very different ways of doing it. And how does the bank reflect those types of traditional values, those types of custom, custom values in when we talk about, okay, this has to be in black and white. You have to do consultations, put it in the resettlement plan. You have to um, um, capture all of this in black and white. So how does that, how do we capture that in a culture where in the Pacific it's so diverse and um, uh, Rebecca touched on it, a lot of the ownership of land, we might know because people who live in the village, who live on their land, they know who the land belongs to. But when um, outsiders come, it's, there's no coordinates, you know, it's not formalized. So how do, how do we capture those in our discussions when we're doing negotiations? So I'm just going to, Stop there, Mayor Pello. Did I answer your question or did Rebecca, yeah. did you want to add in? We might. Um, yeah. I might just really quickly, because we're at the break time, but just in terms of when do we start doing this stuff around land? When do we start looking at, are we using voluntary donation? Are we using negotiated settlement? Is this voluntary or not? When do we start that? So one of the, one of the, Number one things I always keep in my mind is that as per these international standards, construction and activities on a site cannot commence until all of that 
land access stuff is squared off. Okay, so that's the first thing to keep in mind. No shovel is hitting the ground if mm-hmm. all of the all of the agreements are made and the compensation and assistances have been provided. So just as a as a rule in your mind, that's the first one. Land compensation must be paid before this happens. So when do we start? We start as soon as we know we're starting to get a design up from the design team. They're talking about, we're thinking to use this piece of land. That's where we, during the preparation, initiate these consultations with local people about here is a proposal and how can we change this design maybe to actually accommodate something that's better for you? How do we, you know, putting up the principles around what are we trying to do here? Number one, we want to avoid, remember, we want to avoid. So can we do that with the design? Is there another way we could do this to avoid taking private land? So this is in the preparation phase. Now, it's not until with that combination of the consultations and inputs from local people plus the design team coming up with the final design, it's only at that stage that we start to actually go down the land acquisition um, or leasing process. And that might happen at the toward the end of preparation or it might actually happen into the implementation. But it can be a little bit messy because it's iterative. It happens as we go. We keep consulting and moving and but the number one thing is nothing, no land can be touched until whatever the arrangement is, whether it's a lease or compensation for an acquisition, it is paid. So that's a really key important point, I think, for any practitioner. I stop there and um, if, if that's okay with everyone and give you all, um, Joyce, should we make a five minute break so people can go and grab a tea? So if it's okay, we'll just take five minutes now and then meet you all back here. It will be seven past the hour or 37 past the hour, depending on where you are. (laughs) Um, Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone, for your attention till now. And in the next session, it's going to be much more interesting because Joyce is going to get right into the complexity of some of this stuff between the customary governance system versus the state system. We're going to get right into the details of that and we'll really look forward to hearing from you all about uh, your experiences as well. Thanks very much and see you in five minutes. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Take five, everybody. We'll see you in five minutes.
Should we get started? Yes, go ahead. Great. Um, really good to see in the chat Patrick has mentioned. Um, can you present a case study of a typical involuntary or voluntary settlement where the project goes wrong or adverse impacts are faced both by the project and the local community at the same time? So we'll go through that as well. So thanks for that, Patrick. Um, yeah, so good to compare both sides and have a clear picture of what might happen if there's insufficient pre-consultation activities with the locals and other stakeholders. So in our next, um, the part two, we're really gonna go into more of a deep dive and, um, and questions and answers on these types of examples. So um, this is really open to everyone to share, but to just to kick start um, the session, uh, the second um, part two of our training, Rebecca should, do you want to share your screen or if that's okay? So we've gone through a lot of the um, terms and the definitions and here we're looking at um, focusing on land use agreements. So the government formalized or traditional and formal use. And uh, what we wanna be able to really bring out in the second session is to really look because of the complexity of land in the Pacific, we wanna be able to bring out discussions on, um, and there's been a few here with um, Lillian talking about um, land that is government owned, but um, the settlers are on, and there is an um, 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 option for resettlement, but relocation, um, because it is um, land that is viable for mining. So I'm just going to um, talk about a lot of the what you've brought up in the chat, and also Patrick, your question on the comparisons, but uh, just to just to um, go back to the slides and looking at the land use agreement. So when we look at um, you know, projects under the World Bank, ADB, and we really um, wanna be able to apply the policies, um, the World Bank or ADB policies, a lot of the times we really focus on land acquisition and involuntary resettlement. And that's what um, um, Rebecca was talking about. So the focus of okay, there's a project, there's not gonna be any land acquisition, there's not gonna be involuntary resettlement. So let's move ahead. There's no um, impact on land. The question is, there is always going to be um, impact on land. So whether it's a land use, land access, so there's no land acquisition, but still some part of the land will be used for some activities or some minor activities or some part of no land acquisition, but still there'll be land needing, you need to access the land to get to um, for project activities. So here we're really looking at, you know, what are the types of um, formal sort of um, formalized ways where um, we look at, and going back to what Claire mentioned, the perception of people's land. Um, in the Pacific, um, again, going back to Jope's um, comment on the traditional ways and custom ways of, of, you know, recognizing land, it's not necessarily formalized, but it is customary. It is formalized by the customs, by the, the traditional ways of doing things. So, for example, um, for, for me, if I go back to my village, I know exactly what land to go on to, and I know exactly what land not to go on to because of you know, trees that are built or because of my grandfather having explained, you know, this is where your land starts and this is where your land ends. This is where your ocean starts. This is where your ocean ends. This is where you, you know, are able to um, uh, grow your products or this is where you're able to go fishing. So really in our, in our region, it's a, a lot of the complexities are exacerbated because of these traditional and customary ways of doing things. So I think um, when you're doing your assessments, especially for World Bank projects it's in, in our region, a lot of the times you, you'll hear, oh, 90% um, of the land is customary. 
97% of the land is customary. Um, there's only a 5% um, ownership of government that the government owns. When you move out of a lot of the projects are actually taking place outside of main capital cities um, in the Pacific, not necessarily in Port Moresby, not necessarily in Honiara, in Apia, it's also always outside in the outer islands. So um, what do we consider when we're doing these consultations, when we're actually, you know, um, really considering um, our, what to consider in our assessments? Um, and so what you can see in the table is um, some of the considerations can be red tape. Um, so it means a lot of multi-level engagement, a lot of the stakeholders, you know, formalize, the formalized way is engaging stakeholders. The customary way um, is, you know, looking at um, MOUs. So there's not much engagement, is mainly local engagement. You, um, the, so the social structures are already set in the customary setting. Um, but not necessarily um, recognized or looked at from the formalized section, the setting. Um, the timeline, so it takes a long time for, um, it's a long process of engagement, um, a long process of engagement when you're wanting to formalize um, custom, um, customary land, for example, but um, it may take less time because again, Going back to Jope's um, um, comment, um, the informal ways of recognizing land is already um, set in the traditions and uh, that, um, yeah, in the traditional way of doing things. Um, community landowner consultations. Um, we talked about mul doing multiple rounds of consultations. Um, you know, it's ongoing from project preparation all the way through project um, completion. Um, the potential for dispute, um, when it's a formalized, uh, when the land is formalized, the agreement is settled. There's not much um, room, I mean, there's not much risk for uh, potential conflict, but when it is in the customary um, as it's setting, there is, um, a need for ongoing negotiations. Again, a need for ongoing and open agreements and, and negotiations. Um, the government uh, setting and, and the lega legality, um, there's agreements that can be held in court. Uh, the customary where there's also um, the customary governance level that come in. And then um, the local perceptions, um, you know, um, the, when it's formalized, the local people won't not really understand the local, um, the sorry, the government laws. But when it is customary, there is a little bit more respect for local leadership, for local and traditional ways of doing things. Um, so, and and then the last bit, duration of our agreement, should this be fixed in um in the agreement. So sometimes um, formalizing the land agreements is a fixed agreement and some in the customary and not formalizing land agreements in the customary sense is quite fluid and, uh, and um, always changes. But also I think because of the, um, because of the way um, land is passed on by generation from, you know, patrilineal, matrilineal um, generations. So there's a real um, consideration in our region when we're doing assessments is really looking at, um, you know, uh, bringing in the customary um, outlook. The, you know, how do, because we always say, well, 90% uh, of the land is customary in our region. So most of the time we wanna be able to avoid land acquisition because it will create conflict, it will, bring rise to disputes, but um, in some sense, you know, um, when we talk about uh, black and white um, formalization, you know, there's questions of whether some of the customary land should be, um, should it be recorded formally or not? 
to um, improve project um, um, implementation of projects. And I would say um, this is a quite a sensitive topic. So I'm, I have no answer to this and I, I won't say my opinion uh, about it, but um, we really have to take into consideration the customary traditions of land into our assessments. And I think a lot of the times, especially when we're working on projects, it's very easy for project um, team leaders to just want to have the project done. So they'll come in and say, all right, safeguards, environmental uh, social specialists, have a look. Um, World Bank policy is we want to avoid as much as possible land acquisitions and involuntary resettlement. So that's not going to happen. But when you look, when you really do a sort of a deeper assessment of your projects, you will find that a lot of the time there will be um, some significant or minor land impacts in any in one way or another. So whether there is land acquisition or not, whether you um, come across an involuntary resettlement or not, there will still you will still see some form of land use or land access. And this is where you really need to put in and you have the influence, you are able to capable of putting that into the into the project instruments and into the documents. Um, so I think it's really important during your assessment to consider those options, you know, what types of land use and land access. If a road goes past, which is fine, you're you, you're looking at um, a road improvement, but you're, and you need to, before the, uh, uh, in order to um, uh, upgrade the road, they will still need um, access to gravel quarry. So that really tiny access road from the main road to the gravel quarry, that land access and the use of that road that's also someone else's. So you will still need to be able to be negotiating, you know, access to the gravel quarry in order to get the gravels to improve your main road where initially you recognize that there was no need for involuntary resettlement under that project, or um, you need to acquire any additional land to widen the road, but other small activities within the project will potentially lead to still um, the land use and land um, access um, example. Um, I'm just looking at the chat here and I wanna go back to um, what Patrick Patrick's um, comment is about, can you present a case study of a typical involuntary and voluntary settlement where the project goes wrong or adverse impacts are faced both by the project and the local community at the same time. Um, so I think, I mean, Rebecca, do you have any um, examples from your um, experience working in South Asia and um, that you could share with us for this? Yeah, absolutely. So, Okay, well, one of the most famous cases that you might be aware of was um, it was actually in the Philippines, uh, sorry, it was in Cambodia and <clears throat> it was an ADB funded uh, train line. And so basically there was this large train, that, train line that was being built and in the assessment of the affected people, they didn't actually get to count the number of people correctly because it was literally hundreds of thousands of people that had been affected. So firstly, the number of people that were being physically displaced, that is they were being resettled and moved to another place, um, were not adequately accounted for. And then secondly, um, they didn't go into enough information on the livelihoods component. So what happened is people got displaced and moved to another uh, location without having ability to continue uh, connection to accessing the hospital 
so that the kids could keep going to school, so that they were able to keep having an income. So people got moved out, they received some compensation. Some people actually didn't receive compensation. And it's one of, it's a very famous example of a resettlement project that went terribly, terribly wrong and led to um, a huge media uh, and controversy. So you, that case is readily available online and, and, you, can, and look, you can look that one up as an example. Um, I give you a quick example because you've raised something interesting, Patrick, which is what about when uh, resettlement is done poorly and then it impacts the project? So let me give you an example from my own um, experience in Sri Lanka. So um, I was coming in to have a look. I was working for Asian Development Bank at the time and I came in to have a look at uh, how they were applying this land use resettlement standard, which is for ADB. SPS 2009 and what I found is that along a river where they were um, actually improving this river way they were actually taking land on each side of the river and what I found there was that there were houses um, there were people living on the land there um, who had not been um, identified in the early assessment and who were being asked to move off without compensation. So that's against this policy standard that we have spoken about. And construction works had already started. So what we had to do there is we said, um, we put in a corrective action plan. We said, um, construction works will need to halt until these people are fully compensated and relocated. So after one year, the construction works actually continued to move ahead <clears throat> and these people were still, uh, while they had moved, they hadn't been compensated. Now, as I mentioned before, the number one rule is you cannot start using the land until people have been fully compensated. So we, we actually had to say to the Sri Lankan government um, that there was a threat that we would stop disbursement that the bank would stop supporting the project um, unless uh, these people were paid their compensation and the, the construction works, we advised that the construction works be stopped immediately. That, that whole kerfuffle or that whole um, you know, situation there and the amount of time it took to resolve it ended up costing the Sri Lankan government millions of dollars because the construction company sat there and started claiming daily that they could not proceed because the government had not applied the safeguards standards and policy. So that's what can happen when a project doesn't do, doesn't apply these international land use um, involuntary resettlement standards correctly. It has implications that contractors can in fact just claim money uh, while we wait for the government to enact the policy, because this is what is required in the legal agreements or the financial agreements that the policy be applied. So that's an example for you, practically, on how in the Cambodia case, affected people were very poorly um, impacted ultimately through poor, poor relocation, poor consideration of livelihoods. And then in the second case from Sri Lanka, where the project and the government themselves ended up uh, paying a lot uh, and having huge delays and financial implications for not applying the policy. Thanks. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, Patrick, is this um, okay with with your? Um, Hi, Joyce. I've got, um, Joyce, I've got uh, Jope wanting to make a comment. Is that all right? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you, thank you uh, to my fellow and thank you, Joyce. This is just uh, in reply to the good question raised by Rebecca. Do we have experience formalizing a land lease with the Ministry of Lands? Uh, so uh, my experience, uh, Rebecca and Joyce and uh, our good listeners this afternoon, uh, a, a situation in Fiji where informal settlers uh, to a government land are offered a lease uh, so that uh, they can uh, be formalized while occupying the government land. Why they are, the government is doing this? So that uh, they have a sense of ownership of where they are living and uh, maintain it uh, to 
to, 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 to prevent any, any further environmental damages to the type of uh, living that they are, uh, are, are, are doing when they are classified as informal settlers. So there are a few examples in Fiji. I know Claire knows this, and uh, I mean, Yashi will know this. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, it has been happening in Fiji. And I came a few while I was working in the Fiji government. Thank you, uh, uh, Rebecca. Thank you, Jope, for sharing. This is really good. Um, it's a really great platform here to share these types of experience. I think um, one of my experience, and if uh, we have time, we can share, but I'd love to hear more from anyone else in the, in the session, in the, you know, in the training, if you have some good examples or examples that you've experienced on your project, please put your hand up and share. We wanna be able to uh, create this as a more of a sharing platform. My example has been with, um, so in Solomon Islands, um, there, you know, there's the, the formalized way when we're talking about the customary and uh, government formalized or traditional informal agreements. Um, Solomon Islands, and I'm not sure if it's widely known, is actually has, um, it, within the Ministry of Lands, has a section called the Customary Lands Rights um, section. And there's a Customary Lands Rights Action in Solomon Islands um, policy that is being drafted where um, the, the team is actually um, helping to, helping people to register their land, their customary land, but not necessarily connected to the formalized government um, land registration. So it's really, I think there's a lot of fear among the Pacific in the Pacific where you know, if I register my land um, through the government Ministry of Lands in a formal way, this will become government land. Uh, you know, the government will take title of the land. But um, in Solomon Islands, what's happening is there's a, a, a two separate uh, process. So one is formalizing the customary registration, but just so that the landowners are able to um, have a formal um, a record of their land coordinates so that in the effect where they would like to um, go into tourism or echo, you know, create small business entrepreneur um, tourism or echo um, lodges or st stuff, but still keep it within the boundaries of their land and not necessarily engage the government so that it, it's taken over by the government. Um, you know, under the registration of government lands department, there is the potential for them to um, record their coordinates and register their land under the Customary Land Rights Act without um, that fear of the government's going to take over if I formalize um, my land. And, and this is something that I'm, I'm, I am I guess, Jope, that's what you were probably talking about maybe is happening in Fiji. I'm not quite familiar with other re, uh, countries, but in Solomon, this is uh, been um, slowly taking place. It's not in full action. Uh, the min, uh, um, New Zealand and that has been supportive of this uh, um, process of formalizing customary lands um, and recording it under the Customary Land Rights Act. Um, so, I mean, I know that it's very, again, a very complex um, point for, you know, the registration of lands um, and formalizing land um, titles because the fear of, of, um, of giving it away to the government. But um, I think there's definitely room for us to have these types of discussions um, here. And also, again, going back to when you're doing your assessments, really considering the customary um, um, approaches to land because of the, the customary governance that, that are in place, but that are not necessarily linked to the government formalized um, processes and registration. I'll just stop there because I know we've talked a lot, but I'd love to hear from everyone else in the in the training sessions
Thank you, thank you, Joyce. If I may, uh, sorry to take the floor again. And uh, again, uh, I, I must, must reiterate myself on uh, I really like this session. And uh, thanks to you too, uh, you, Joyce, and uh, Rebecca. And Rebecca, may I uh, acknowledge when you started your, your presentation, you, you emphasized the point of avoiding, avoiding. Uh, and uh, there you gain at least the, the relevance of uh, the mitigation hierarchy for any land development work. And uh, may I, uh, may I uh, just uh, bring back this, uh, this subject of uh, forced acquisition of land. And uh, again, this is uh, an example that it is not project related, but again, an example for Fiji. Uh, I know Claire and uh, many will uh, have experience in this too. Uh, it's, it's not really forced acquisition. This is to do with village boundaries. So uh, in Fiji, there are marked village boundaries. And uh, sometimes uh, we need, uh, there is a need to extend the village boundaries and it is uh, required and uh, it must be done. And in that situation, it's not really forced, but again, the use of uh, consulting the landowners that need to be, the land to be acquired for this particular village purpose uh, is important. Uh, again, um, I just want to revisit that uh, term that you use, Rebecca, uh, on uh, forced acquisition. An example I would like to share is it's the expansion of village boundary, increasing population, building of number of houses, and um, sometimes uh, some landowners, they stop uh, the village expansion into their own land. So through the village council, they have to go through the government, existing government system to allow these landowners uh, to, to give portion of their land to extend the village boundary. So I just want to share again another example from the Fiji situation. Thank you, uh, Rebecca, and thank you, Joyce. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jope. So in that case, was that more of a voluntary land donation? Would you see that as a voluntary land donation, Jope? Oh, Joyce, I can explain that if you like. Um, That'd be great. Fiji, Fiji's got a, a very a benefited very well from their registration system um, because their land is registered for the most part compared to other Pacific Island countries. But with the Itoke communities, they have reserve and non-reserve land. And back in the 60s, the government earmarked that reserve land where it enables people to live for their own sustenance in their own community. Um, what's happening, obviously, in a lot of communities in Fiji is that they're reaching the limits of those lands. They've, the population has grown and they're needing more land. So um, it's, it's a complicated negotiation process, I, I believe, for those landowners. But I think Jepez read some really good points earlier and, and this one as well about all of the land dealings we have, whether it's, you know, the customary landowners and their own challenges or for the purpose of a project. There's such an intergeneral, intergenerational aspect to it that's often forgotten about in our projects. So we typically look at things for the life of the project um, and, and ob obviously once the road's built, we kind of move on. Um, but every project I've worked on, there's always legacy land issues because there's an intergenerational aspect here that, that also... Um, doesn't get talked about when you're looking at it through a policy only lens, but it's definitely the reality of working in the Pacific. Thanks. Thanks, Claire. That's really good to know. And I think, thank you for sharing. Um, and that point on intergenerational, I think that's really a, a, a critical um, point because again, going back to when you're doing your assessment of um, and preparing a resettlement plant, you know, what are the types of things that you'd like, you'd need to consider and um, intergenerational, um, you know, um, ownership of land is something that we don't necessarily think of um, when we look at um, doing our assessments. We're really focused on what Claire mentioned, the, that time frame of project. So it is within the project time frame, but really as practitioners and experts in this field, 
this is where we are able to influence the project, right? So this is where we come in to take, bring in these considerations that the engineers wouldn't think of, the, you know, the project uh, team leaders wouldn't think of. Um, and I had a question about budget in the chat. So if the budget is limited, do we just go for one, one um, you know, one option? And again, reiterating this here as practitioners, we are actually capable of influencing the project. And, and that's why it's very important to come right in through project design, you know, um, these types of considerations that we actually can think of do, when do we do our assessments right at the start will influence the project. And that's where you come in. That's where we all come in. That's why we're here. And I think really good to be able to consider this. And especially as practitioners, you are, um, a lot of your practi practitioners from the region, from your countries, local, local based, and all of the considerations that you can think of that are specific to your country, specific to the country context, in terms of if you know what the traditions are, if you know what the customs are, if you know that you know that a lot of the impacts are going to affect intergenerational ties to the land that you're that will potentially the project will be um, um, implement, implementing or you know the activities will be on that specific um, land within the project time frame you have to think beyond and outside of the box to be able to consider all of that into your instruments and i'm just going back a bit more technical um drawing on you know what are types of of um, assessments what what does it look like on paper and black and white because we want to be able to um, preserve i guess the customs and we always talk about the pacific and the land complexities that it has and and i think it's a really good point to be able to capture all of that within the instruments that we're able to prepare. And again, going back to, you know, you are the, the, the ones who are able to bring those out of, um, you know, and out into the light and be able to capture that in the instruments. Um, I have a question. Yes. I, I like your question to be on the example I use in Fiji. Um, so is it involuntary or is it a donation? Uh, I'll give it a shot and uh, uh, it's it, it involuntary, it must be done uh, so that uh, it can address the need of uh, the, the population in need. Great, thank you. And so because it's involuntary and it must be done, how do you um, what are the types of consultation and how do you capture that to um, in your instruments? Maybe I ask that uh, you <laughs> respond to the wider audience, please. Uh, <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> Thank you. <laughs> comments on the chat box, Joyce. Thanks, Mapello. Let's see. So, Patrick, dealing with land acquisition for a service delivery project can be a simpler than dealing with land where project that generates revenue for a government. Um, and then one of the challenges with land, customary land registration from Yonatana, uh, one of the challenges with customary land registration falls within multiple ownership amongst family and ties. Yes, that's true. So I think what is really important is, you know, the, um, and I, a lot of the mining sector has done um, geneal genealogy mapping of, you know, who are the rightful landowners. I'm not, it's quite a detailed and extensive piece of work, but um, I think one of the key things that was part of the consultation is really spending a lot of that time with, okay, um, you know, ownership, uh, talking to the households, talking to the landowners and and really uh, depicting the ownership and the rights. And because a lot of times, you know, we all know that, you know, sometimes we talk to that one person who says, I'm the own, I, I own this land, but the real owner lives overseas. And so how do you determine who the real owner is? And um, I guess a lot of the consultations, getting the accountability of the community to recognize the identity of, of um, 
the landowners. Claire, you've got your hand up. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I have a question on that um, specifically um, because I guess having worked in the mining oil and gas sector as well as infrastructure projects and other right, rural development, community development projects, um, there's a real different approach in terms of landowner identification. Um, I think PNG's got the advantage of having legislation that spells out the need for a social mapping and landowner identification. What's your opinion or other people's opinion about those sorts of studies? So it's um, SMLI, social mapping and landowner identification for those people that haven't heard that before. Do you think we could be doing that in development partner funded projects as instead of a more, I guess, ad hoc approach? Could we have a bit more of a, um, I guess, standard approach across the board? Yeah, I think it would be, um, I mean, I've also worked in the mining sector and, and uh, like I said, it is quite an extensive um, piece of work because it doesn't happen over, you know, a month. Um, but I would say the suggest, I would say, you know, it's better to get started than to not do it at all. So um, I would say, you know, it's quite good to have these land, um, like you said, mapping identification, um, mainly because as we look, move for, forward into more bigger infrastructure type of projects, we're really looking at our region is, you know, we talk about infrastructure project, but compared to our colleagues in China, for example, the type, the scale and activity of the projects are a lot bigger in China. So they're really looking at, you know, um, resettlement plans for thousands of people. And we're only looking at resettlement plans for maybe a couple hundred or 50 people. But it is, but the difference with the re, our region is really that customary ownership and how to preserve that customary rights and, and, and such. And a lot of the times, and I think when one of the, the chat boxes, it talks about, you know, the manipulation and of the land ownership rights, you know, where we as World Bank practitioners can go into the, the a community and I say, okay, who is the light, right land owner? And, and someone puts their hand up. And again, like I said, but the real owner can probably would probably be living overseas and not have any say or have any voice. So I think it's really important when you're actually doing these assessments and it would be um, a good standard to have to, to have additional exercises on the types of mapping. But again, when we look at World Bank projects, there's a time frame, right? Because where we're so limited in the timeline of the project, you know, it has to be implemented, has to be um, um, within the three years or five years. But if you can influence as a practitioner, you know, those types of decisions and where you see, I would say large infrastructure scale projects where you see the potential for real risky impacts on land and you can contribute to the identification of landowners so that it's done in a better way that there's the standards are are set from the get-go then I would say yeah I think definitely ask for extra budget to have those types of exercises to go through those assessments um, if you can. Rebecca did you have any input into that? I just wanted to add that um, there's absolutely no reason that social mapping and land identification is not done as part of a donor funded project. There's no reason that it would not be done. Um, if it's not been done, it's because the, the social development practitioner, the land practitioner or expert who's inputting has maybe not suggested it, um, but, but absolutely that forms part of this policy standard because we have to know who the rightful land owners are in order to proceed with any type of land agreement. Um, in every case, um, so the, in every case of uh, land acquisition, in every country, 
there's a different process which the government itself has put out for how to get at who are the rightful customary land owners. So in PNG, we just heard from Claire, there's a specific piece which I would imagine involves anthropologists doing kingship mapping, etc. And for example, I've seen in Vanuatu, it's a different approach that's being taken, but still there's a, a whole process laid out for how it is that you identify the rightful customary owners, how that is agreed with the traditional, like through the traditional governance system, i.e. by using chiefs, by using local leaders, and there would be a process. So in every every country, you have to look at the context and see what has been put up by the government and the customary um, sort of governance system. And then also team that with your experience and your resources that will help to get at the question of who is the rightful ownership. In no situation can a project skip this. We must identify who the rightful owners are in order to get through the process. And when we're talking about um, oh, so I just wanted to ask though, um, because I know we've got some colleagues from Solomon, working in Solomon Islands, working in Samoa, um, it would be really interesting to hear how are customary owners identified in the context of those countries where you've worked? Um, and I also know we've got Lisa on the phone who has worked in Vanuatu and heard some of these discussions happening over customary land ownership in Vanuatu. So would be please feel welcome to unmute yourselves and, and tell us a little bit about what you saw in those country contexts. There's a really good um, chat on the from Kisa about Samoan customary landowners. Um, Kisa says Samoan customary landowners have such a traditional stronghold over lands. The influence of shared landowners overseas can be a risk. Um, when project uh, can be a risk too when projects and land compensation is being discussed and planned, and and that's really that's true. I think you know like the discussion of compensation and compensation can actually create more conflict sometimes. And um, uh, but I'll leave it there. We'll hear from others with their experience, and then we can I'll reply to Kisa maybe or if anyone has a, an experience and would like to reply. Um, hi, this is uh, Kisa from Samoa. Hi um, Kisa. I just want to elaborate on, hi, hi everyone. I um, just want to elaborate on my comment. Um, uh, and particular reference to a, a, a project in Savai, um, it was a bridge development project, um, and this is at the design phase. Um, and it was interesting how one particular family, when they were we were looking at the the design of the bridge and the location of a of a road, which was going to benefit the whole village. There was one particular family. Um, so this is how we did the. Okay, so. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you, Kisa. Yep, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, sorry, this was at the the um, phase when we were um, conducting doing a lap for the World Bank um, land land acquisition resentment plan. Um, so there was one particular family that um, were so their family, their uh, what do you call it? Um, I don't know what a hut, like a hut. What house? Um, Traditional house. Traditional open values. Anyway, so it wasn't a significant. Um, it was one of those houses where they would rest when they were doing, you know, like um, horticultural work, uh, you know, plantation work. So that was basically it was in the way of where the road was designed to go, um, following the bridge. Um, and so during the the the, uh, the develop the phase where we were uh, consulting the, the community and uh, developing the the lab, the land acquisition plan, and um, they basically they agreed. They agreed to um, a five thousand tala compensation, which you know maybe it may seem insignificant to a lot of you, but um, the the agreement was that they would be relocated to another 
Um, so their, their, this hut will be relocated to another part of their, their land. Um, and, and plus, you know, part of the um, agreement was that a better house was going to, you know, um, um, a better, well, you know, uh, for lack of a, a better term, like a, a nice hut will be built for them. So the agreement was there at that stage. And then when the project was about to be implemented, um, the family decided that they want to change their mind. So um, we we did discover later on that they had been discussing. So remember that in some or customary, these, you know, customary landowners are all over the place. So for one particular land, you can have up to about five to 10 people who are attached to that particular land. So if you're a chief in Samoa, you have, you know, have every right to say yes or no. So obviously during the stage from the time of the design to the time of implementation, um, there was a bit of influence from some of the, the shared owners overseas. And then the family decided to say no. They decided they weren't going to move, which actually put a, a hold you know, it, you know, it brought a halt to the, to the project commencement and we tried to consult again. And so that's what I meant about such a stronghold that even though the government tried as much as possible to, to offer compensation and and uh, introduce what the, you know, the, um, the longer term benefits were going to be for the family. Um, and unfortunately, they decided not to, you know, budge. So the funny thing is, if you ever come back to Samoa and you go down this particular road that I'm talking about, you would see that there is that paleo or that that house is still standing there. Unfortunately, they 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 um, decided not to go with the um, compensation. I think uh, the the I I think what everyone you know thought was that the, the, the influence from overseas was stronger, that the compensation of 5,000 wasn't enough, and that they should actually argue, you know, don't budge until you're offered a better price. So unfortunately that didn't happen, and we decided to change the design and the road. Um, and now it's, you know, it's a wonderful road. You know, a lot of people have gained access to the, uh, to the rest of the island. And yeah, so that's what I meant by, you know, customer landers can actually say no to the government, even though, you know, there's compensation offered, a lot of consultation, um, and yeah, that's the stronghold I was talking about. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to share that, and I, I think it's all got to do with consultation. Consult, 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 that's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you so all right, much. Thanks, you, um, uh, hi, Joyce. Uh, we've gone over the hour. We're almost at four. In fact, they've allowed us to go over 30 minutes. So uh, we're now entering into um, a full symposium, uh, two hours. <laughs> um, just wondering if uh, you, uh, are, uh, in terms of your presentation, are you ready to wrap up? Yeah, so um, we're, we're, that's it, I think, for us. We're just really the second session was to uh, engage you all into more of a discussion. It's been really great. So I think if you have any questions on land um, um, specific to you know, some of the instruments in the policy of the World Bank, please do not hesitate to contact myself or Rebecca. And uh, I think Rebecca, I'm not sure if you have any last words you'd like to say, but um, for me, I'd like to just thank everyone for your participation. Thank you so much for your time. Matt Pello and Jope and everyone at Spread, thank you so much for um, linking us all together. And I wish you all a great afternoon from me, thank probably you. evening or lunchtime for you guys. <laughs> thank you very much, Joyce and Rebecca. Please, everybody, I know you would join me if I ask you to please put your hands together. I'm thanking our excellent trainers, Rebecca, Dr. Ramsey, and Joyce from the World Bank. Thank you for today's uh, training. It was most Useful, I learned a lot. Um, hopefully others, I mean, land is never um, a simple topic. Uh, obviously we can all agree that uh, that is, it presents its own challenges and difficulties, but I think what we try to present here is sort of examples of how the World Bank would apply the ESS, the standard five on issues dealing with land acquisitions, uh, volunt um, uh, restrictions, and so forth. So, um, you know, th there are best practices out there. Uh, obviously, countries have their own way of managing land issues, but the bank also has its own sort of uh, ex uh, ex um, 
best practices that they like to bring into the into the discussions and makes and hopefully it makes things a bit more easier. Uh, like Rebecca, uh, like uh, Joyce said, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to them. We will upload all the presentations on the PNEA. So please, uh, um, Ivan will uh, notify you. Um, thanks for those who haven't subscribed, please do. Um, my colleague, Jill, will send out the um, link for the evaluation. So please do complete those evaluations so we can send you your training certificate in due course. Other than that, the only thing left for me is to let you know about tomorrow's uh, session. That's on module 14. It's uh, the Environmental Monitoring and Management Plan or EMMP. And that will be led primarily by the Asian Development Bank, uh, Ms. Jean Williams and Mr. Alan Sewell with contribution from Dr. Gregory Barbara of SPREP and Dr. Hilda Sakiti Wanga of USP. Hopefully we'll have them on board. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, have a great one. We'll see you tomorrow, same time, same place. Take care. Bye-bye.